But today, we're going to dive into really week two of talking through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. This is a famous section of scripture, at least part of it is, um, on the armor of God. Um, I don't know if there's anything that's been illustrated more or been more Sunday schooled out than the armor of God, right? Many of us, if you were raised in church, you can see the coloring sheet right now. Like you can picture it, you remember it, you know the illustrations, you've seen it. Um, and yet, I really believed this, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're not hiding under a rock. It is an election year. We're a month out from an election. And, and whenever this happens, divisions, the name of the game, animosity, anger, frustration, heightened emotions, all types of things begin to come out of people. And I was really praying. I was like, God, I, I really want a series that helps to remind us what it means to be kingdom of God oriented. What does it mean to really know who we serve, what we're about, where our hope is, so we don't lose our bearings in all the crazy. I really believe, we talked about it last week, that the attacks of the enemy is trying to get you to lose your bearings. The, the enemy is trying to get you to buy into lies, to try to get you distracted about what your fight is, what the battle actually is. And so last week, we dove into the first couple of verses in, uh, uh, started in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, and we read this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We talked about the first thing that you need if you're going to wear the armor of God is you've got to be strong in the Lord because it's actually the armor of God. It's his armor, and you can't carry it on your own. You need to be strengthened in the Lord in order to handle the armor we're about to talk about. And then we're to put on the full armor of God, not part of it, the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What's your fight? Who's your fight against? Last week we said know your fight. What's the fight? Is it people? Is it people that don't agree with you? Is it people that live different than you? Are the people the problem? The people the problem? No. The Apostle Paul would suggest that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. Which with, it, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Come on, church, can I get a good amen off of that? That is a whole text right there. There's so much here, which is why we're taking a few weeks to sort of break it down and try to understand this a little bit more. So we're trying to put on the full armor of God so we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. And again, we know that the Apostle Paul would have been inspired. He would have known the words of the prophet Isaiah out of chapter 59, verse 17, where the prophet Isaiah said this about God in God's approach to sin. All of chapter 59 was sort of a breakdown of God's answer to sin and how he responds to sin. It says this, he put on righteousness as his body armor, and place the helmet of salvation on his head. Breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. We can see where the Apostle Paul's inspiration came from. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance. This is vengeance towards sin. And wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. There is something so transparent and real about the idea of putting on this full armor of God. And while this can sort of become that verse that we just sort of know, like we just know it, and we can just sort of throw it away, it's actually highly important that we begin to understand and break down the different components of what it means to stand in the midst of the attacks and stand against the enemy, the devil's scheme, stand in the face of the fight. And um, the first one we're going to talk about this morning is uh, that our feet are to be fitted with the readiness that comes from the 
gospel of peace. The readiness that comes, our feet are to be fitted, and it comes from what? The gospel of peace. And so as we break down three different components of the armor, we'll do three more next week. The first question I have for you, I've got three questions today. The first one is, how is your footing? How's your footing in 2024, October 13th, how's your footing? What are you standing on? What are you building your life on? What foundation do you have? How's your footing? Do you feel like everything's slipping out from underneath you? Do you feel like everything's just washing away? Or do you feel sturdy and strong because the readiness that comes from the footing of being actually standing directly on the gospel of peace? And a good question would be, right, what is the gospel of peace? What's, what's the gospel of peace, Pastor Sam? Like, what actually is that? Well, it's the story of our salvation. It's the story of Jesus' birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and his imminent return. It's the gospel message. It's, message. it's the very thing that God gave, that Jesus gave to his apostles, the disciples, and he said, go and plant my church and go bring this to the ends of the earth. This message, I'm going to equip you with it. This gospel is not just a message you preach, it's a message you live. I, I want you to embrace this. And right, we understand in Scripture that it was on Peter's revelation of who Jesus was. Jesus said on that revelation of understanding who I am, that's going to be the rock on which I build my church. It's the revelation of Jesus that is the gospel that allows us to have a secure footing. That gives us the strength to then build and to reach and to grow and to do everything that God has called us to do. We have to understand the gospel message of Jesus. And the reality is, right, how many of you know that story, though, doesn't sound very peaceful. If you watch Passion of the Christ, if you have any understanding of Jesus, if you've ever been to an Easter ser- or a Good Friday service, you know how the story goes. It doesn't feel peaceful. It feels really aggressive and violent, and he was beaten, and he was bloodied, and he was put on a cross, and you be like, ah, I just... I mean, I, I don't really understand. I mean, is, isn't peace just absolute calm and quiet? Isn't peace just a removal of anything that could ever cause a problem or an issue? But the reality is that the gospel of peace, the peace that Jesus offers, is not a peace that does not include storms. It's a peace that goes with you in the middle of storms. It's, it's very different. I think it was actually illustrated by a guy who went viral this week because of hur- the hurricane. And, uh, and they called him like the real life Lieutenant Dan. And, uh, and he's a guy who lives on a boat in Florida. He was all over every major news outlet picked up this story. It was all over social media because he refused to leave his boat. So, so the hurricane's coming right at where he is. He's going to go through the eye of the storm. And he's like, come on, a boat feels safer than land right now. Like I'm staying in my boat. This is my home. And people wanted to make him leave, and legally the authorities can't force him to leave. And all of social media is like, you're crazy. You're going to die. You're so stupid. He's like, this is my boat. I'm going to hang out in my boat. I know the storm's coming. He goes, I've been through a hurricane before. I'm going to sit in this boat. And uh, the storm came and crashed, and he went right through the storm on his boat. And he said, the only way I'm going to get out is if my boat falls apart. My boat falls apart, I'll get out of the boat. And he was uh, interviewed after the storm. His boat held. And he came out completely fine. He was interviewed after, and they said, how did you, like, manage to, like, mentally stay in your boat? And Haley goes, well, I was in my boat, and I don't know how this all works, but I started praying to God, and I'm sitting in the middle of my boat, and when I started praying, I had been getting tossed all around, hitting the sides of my boat, but when I started praying, all of a sudden it felt like I was in some kind of protection, and I stopped hitting the sides of the boat. And all of a sudden I sat in the middle, my boat was rocking, but I was unmoved, and I'm just sitting there. He's like, I don't know how this works. I was just praying. And he's just talking so matter of fact. And as I'm hearing this this week, I'm like, that is such a picture of the peace that God gives. That the storm hits, you're in the boat, Jesus himself, how many know he slept? In the bottom of a boat, in the middle of a storm, right? That's the picture of the kind of peace. It's not the peace that means you'll never experience pain, that, 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 that the storms aren't going to hit. The gospel of peace is the thing that we're supposed to be standing on so that when the storm hits, we are unmoved. That the waves don't knock us over. That this kind of peace allows us to withstand whatever life throws at us, whatever the devil's schemes produce. 
Because that's the fight. That's the battle. It's his schemes. But what are his schemes? His schemes are trying to knock you off your footing. We're called to stand. And there's been a significant debate on how to argue Paul's words here in Ephesians chapter 6 into making a statement for going on the attack. Like changing the language, shifting it to make it super offensive. Because people say things like this, well, I know all the armor was defensive, but you got the sword of the spirit, right? And so we got to be on the offense. We got to be on the attack at all times. And the reality is that Paul, if you do a word study on stand, he literally means stand. Because what we're going to see as we peel back the layers is we're standing on a victory that we already have. So, so the reality is that the, the way we operate in the world is we stand strong for all of the things that the armor of God represent. And we stand strong on the gospel of peace making a difference. And so when the enemy's coming, he's going, we, the enemy's already lost. So his only hope is to get you to deviate from the truth of God's word. His only hope is to lie to you and get you off track and to get you unstable so you can't stand. Right, because come on, let's be honest. Doesn't it sound a little more fun to be like, I want to be the hero of the story. I'm going to go, I'm going to go slice and dice. Let's go, I'm going to go take some people out. Like, come on, I'm going to get all aggressive. I'm going to go take some ground. It's all about me. But the tension with that is that's very American. That's very Western. Biblical says Jesus is the hero. <laughs> Jesus is the hero of my story. I'm not the center of the the narrative, and I'm not the hero of the story. And so who am I standing on? I'm not standing on my victory. I'm standing on Jesus' victory. And so the problem is when the devil lies to me that I don't already have the victory, that I don't have power over him, that I don't have power over the spirits of this age. But we do. We just have to keep our footing. Let me illustrate a little bit further the importance of footing. Zach and Philip, come on back up here. I'm just putting you guys to work today. Let's go give it up for Zach and Philip. Love them. You see, the gospel of peace shifts how we see the fight. When we get this right, it shifts how we see the fight. So we know we win if we can't be moved from our footing. It's all about our footing. So we're going to do, I'm going to go full youth pastor here. Come on, I was a youth pastor for 10 years. I'm going full youth pastor here. So we got a little tug of war action going on. And I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Um, I need some crowd support, okay? We like to be a vocal church. We like to make some noise. I need some crowd support. Support. Are you going to go and put your money on? We're not a betting church. I get it. Betting's illegal. It's a phrase. It's fine. Calm down. Are you putting your money on Mr. Sturdy, Zach Favors, or Mr. Skinny, Philip Brown? I just need to know. I just need to know. How many of you are going for Sturdy and Zach Favors to win tug of war? Not that many. Not that many. Okay. How many going Skinny, Mr. Philip Brown? That's a pity support. I'm putting my money on Mr. Zach Favors. Here we go. So we're going to get ready. Get, all they have to do to win is to knock the other person off balance, to get them to lose their footing. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. That's an interesting strategy. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's one of the worst strategies I've ever seen. Okay. So now... Guys, how many feel like Philip needs another chance to redeem himself? All right, let's give this another shot. Let's give this another shot. Let's try again. How many of you guys, your money's on Zach Favors now? You're like, hey, time's shifting. How many guys, you're feeling Philip Brown? He's going to redeem himself? Okay. All right, here we go. In three, two, hold up. Take your shoes off. Zach, kick your shoes off. Take them off. What you got, socks? Okay. So now, how many of you are for Mr. Philip Brown? Okay. How many still got your money on Zach? All right. Here we go. In three, two, one, go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Let's go. Give it up for Zach and Philip. I think the illustration speaks for itself. Right? It doesn't matter how much strength you have if your feet aren't fitted correctly. It didn't matter the center of gravity. didn't matter the strength of his arms. didn't matter his stance even for Zach. The moment his feet were no longer fitted with the right footwear, everything else fell apart. 
and he's able to be literally pulled wherever Philip wanted to take him. And I think for a lot of us, when we get the gospel wrong and we start to build our life on anything else, you have to understand Jesus is consistently He's um, illustrated as being the cornerstone of our life. In fact, it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. The, the, the main block that we're supposed to build our whole life on. It was a topic we had at Men's Discipleship on Wednesday uh, this week. Talking about is he actually the cornerstone? Is he the thing that is really the foundation that you are standing on to then approach the rest of your life? If we get the gospel wrong, right, when did... When did Peter, be, be, was he told, hey, you're Peter, the rock, and I'm going to build my church on you? It was after he answered the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? If you answer that question wrong, if you get the question wrong of who do you say I am, everything else won't matter. We have to be able to answer correctly who Jesus is. We have to. Jesus, you are the son of God. Jesus, you are my Savior. Jesus, I'm going to put my faith and my trust and my hope in you. In another letter to the church, to a church, Paul wrote this, and it ties in so beautifully with his letter to the church at Ephesus. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 10, he says this, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. This is just another illustration, same point, feet fitted with the gospel piece. He's saying, let your roots grow down into him, into Jesus, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. We're going to get back to truth with the belt of truth in a moment. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. High-sounding nonsense. Sounds like he had a similar issue that we do in America today, doesn't it? (laughs) Empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world. Realize, high-sounding nonsense is just a devil's scheme. It's just a lie. It's just something that, man, well, that's a good argument. That's what, I don't know. I I mean, mean, it sounds kind of interesting. And it comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ who is the head over every ruler and every authority. Jesus fought death, hell, and the grave and he won. And it's at his name that every knee has to bow. So he's already got that victory. So when we stand and we build our life on faith in Jesus, we have sure footing. Because Paul is consistently and continually stressing the strength of our footing, our position, our ability to stand. And that it all comes from the message of Jesus. So if the gospel, this message of peace doesn't bring peace to the situation, then I don't know if it's the gospel of Jesus. It is the gospel of peace. That means it should bring peace to a hurting world. It should bring peace to those around you. It should bring peace to your lives. I love the phrase non-anxious presence. Come on, we all love that person that comes in a room and just brings a calm, just brings a steadiness, just brings a truth and a hope to them. Come on. But when Christians lose their peace, they kind of become a little unattractive to the world, if I'm being really honest. When we lose that deep sense of I have peace in the midst of this storm, how we handle loss, grief, suffering, sickness, how we handle the pains of the world are, is often the way in which we preach the gospel so well. Because I have hope that you don't have. I don't grieve like the world grieves. I grieve differently. I handle my pain differently because I know Jesus. So we lose our footing, just like Zach, when we misuse his message. We don't build our life on that gospel. When we make it about us, And we gain footing when we live by the peace provided in the gospel. Second question is off of the breastplate of righteousness in place. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, the question I would ask you is, how is your heart? You see, righteousness is consistently and continually linked to our heart. And so what you have to understand is that the breastplate is the covering for the heart. And Paul often within his writings, connected our righteousness to our heart. 
So this is not some kind of coincidence that the breastplate of righteousness is what covers your heart. For example, Romans 10.10. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right, righteous, with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. But here's the tension. Righteousness, I've found, the longer I pastor and the longer I serve Jesus, so really for me and my personal walk with Jesus, and then me navigating and pastoring people who are walking with Jesus, I've watched as our view of righteousness really dictates a whole lot of our faith. So, for example, the longer you serve God, if you sort of, if you're not cultivating a relationship, when you're not spending time with him, one of the lies that the enemy is going to get you with, and he gets a lot of Christians to fall prey of, is works-based righteousness, law-based righteousness. And works-based righteousness, if I were to use the simplest of language, and don't worry, we've got more scripture to talk about this. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear. But works-based righteousness is this. Do good, avoid bad, now you're righteous. Do good, avoid bad. There's Christianity for you. There's faith. That's what it looks like. But if you do bad and you avoid good, you're unrighteous. It's that simple. Just come on. Come on, church. Can't you figure it out? Just do good. Be better. (laughs) Do good. Make right choices all the time, and you'll be righteous. How many of you know that the moment you start actually breaking that down, you're like, that sounds pretty defeating. (laughs) That sounds really sad. That sounds pretty impossible, unless you're a whole lot more holy than I am. That sounds impossible, because I face a lot of different moments in my life. There's a lot of things that come at me. There's a lot of things you deal with. And if my righteousness is in question every single time I ever make a mistake, we have a significant problem, right? But what is righteousness? It's not this. This is essentially this do good and avoid bad, now you're righteous. This is essentially falls in line with the carrot and the stick sort of thinking. How many of you ever heard the phrase carrot or stick? You've heard this. If you actually research... It's an old story of two masters riding their donkeys in a race. And one had a switch made of a stick, and he beat his donkey along as hard as he could. He would whip this donkey. He'd go, faster, you're not going fast enough. you got to be better than that. He's abusing it. He's hurting his donkey, trying to urge it on. Come on, you terrible donkey. And then the other one decides to tie a, a carrot from a piece of a string on a stick and hold the carrot out in front of the donkey. And the donkey is doing everything he can to try to earn the reward, to try to get to the carrot, but inevitably it's always out of reach. And sometimes people have actually misused this and said, you want to be a master who has the carrot, not the stick. But can I tell you, actually, both of those are really toxic forms of manipulation and motivation, right? It's essentially keep being obedient, and maybe I'll bless you with a carrot. If you just keep doing good, I might decide to give you a carrot. But I'm going to keep it out in front of you, and the only reason, the only way I'm trying to motivate you is would you just do good so that maybe you can earn a carrot. Or it's you better do good or I'm going to punish you. You better do good or the stick is coming. It's out. Right? And both of these examples are for the master's good. It's not for the donkey. It's for the master. So how could this be a view of righteousness? How could this be a view of our God? It's not. I love how the psalmist puts it. Our God has a rod and a staff. And the rod and the staff are very different than the carrot and the stick. And it's the rod and the staff that comfort you. Let me explain. If you don't know, the rod and the staff are shepherd's terms. Shepherds didn't just have the classic uh, Christmas shepherd's crook. Come on, we all know the, the shepherd's crook, crook from Christmas. He also, he had the staff and he also had a rod. And what would happen is they would actually, when they had their sheep, they both had a use. And the rod would be used to, when the sheep was heading towards something hurtful, painful, the rod would be used to actually prevent the sheep from experiencing more pain. 
It was for the sheep's benefit. So the discipline would come, no, 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 don't go that way. There's a cliff. No, 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 don't go off on your own. Don't get individualistic thinking because if you do, there's wolves that will devour you. So the rod, they would be used to hit its legs and motivate it with a little bit of pain to keep it from more pain. And then the, 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 the staff would be used to guide. It would actually be used to like keep them in line and keep them guided on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Realize the difference. Carrot and stick, it's all about the master. Getting what he wants, abusing and using the donkey as a tool to meet his end. The rod and the staff, it's about relationship. It's about love. The discipline comes when there's more pain on the other side if we don't listen to it. The guidance comes and guides us along the paths of righteousness. And we need that help. So he, he, so really, if you have works-based righteousness, this thinking leads to a God whose only chance of blessing you comes if you impress him enough. If you can just be impressive enough, maybe God will bless you. If you can just figure it out, if you can just finally, could you just get it together? Come on, get it together, and maybe I'll do something good for you. But isn't that interesting that the Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord receives it. Rather than just those who impress Jesus enough, then he'll come to them. No, no, no. My Bible says everyone who calls on his name will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus gets to experience him. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus gets to be clothed in his righteousness, gets to wear the breastplate of righteousness. You see, an incorrect lens towards righteousness will always negate your process of discipleship. When we get this righteousness narrative wrong, our discipleship journey looks like carrot and stick. But when we get it correct, it looks like rod and staff. Hey, God, I need your guidance and I need your correction, but all of it is for my good. You care about my good. You care about my well-being. I'm a creation that you love. You are not an angry master driving me, trying to get something out of me. You are a loving father. You're a father who wants good things for his children, has good gifts for his children. So I trust both your rod and your staff. It's not some sort of carrot that I'll never quite get to. So let's look at the word to back this up. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Let's stop there for just a second. This is the Apostle Paul. Let's think about his story arc. So he was a very pious Jewish man who lived according to the law, and pursuing righteousness according to the law, what did it lead him to? Literally murdering Christians. Killing human beings for the sake of trying to earn righteousness. Trying to earn his way. So if there's anybody who has a very visceral view of righteousness, both law righteousness, works-based righteousness, and faith and grace-based righteousness, it's Paul. He actually damaged that many lives in pursuit of righteousness. When we get this conversation wrong, when we get the breastplate of righteousness wrong, our heart is exposed and we can find ourselves doing a lot of things incorrectly. But he said, no, rather I become righteous through faith in Christ. Also, if he can be made righteous, there's hope for you. Right? I need this. Man, if he can be made righteous through Christ, through faith in Jesus, then there is hope for me. Because there are some of you in this room, the idea of righteousness, doing right, seems so far off. And you're like, man, it's just out there. And it's unachievable. It really is that carrot that I can't get to. But the reality is Jesus said, hey, I'll just bring the carrot to you. Come on. You got this. Let's do this. Let's figure it out. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. You cannot be made right with God without faith in Jesus. It does not work. So our righteousness 
is actually found through the person of Jesus. One thing you're going to realize is that there is not one piece of the armor of God that we can wear without Jesus. God made sure that all of the ways go through his story, his narrative. All the pieces of armor for us to wear them require Jesus. You are not righteous because you did so much good. You are righteous because you are living under the grace of Jesus. He's doing it. Final question as the keys come on up. We're going to talk about the belt of truth for a moment. The belt of truth that's buckled around our waist. And off of truth, I have a question. There's a lot of different angles and conversations you can have on truth. But this morning, I want to ask you a question. How is your trust? See, one of the tensions of truth is you might be able to get yourself to a place where I believe the Bible is true, but I don't trust the life it offers. And I think that a lot of times we end up there. You see, the, the, the belt of truth, it's a belt. So that means it holds all the armor together. And actually, in fact, armor, all armor required belts to secure them. The belt of truth is holding the whole thing together. And it's one thing to be like, I believe it happened. I, I believe it to be true, but I don't know if I trust it with my life. I don't know if I trust the practices, the disciplines, the approaches that are mapped out in scripture. I'm not positive that that's going to lead to the most fulfilling life. The greatest tension is when you try to have Jesus and have the world too. It consistently is broken. It doesn't work. And I think the biggest threat to the truth of who God is in the life he offers is not the arguments against his existence, but a lack of trust in the process. So it's like the moment you put your faith in Jesus, all the devil's trying to do is get you to not follow his ways. I don't know, you can still be the hero of your story. You accept to Jesus. It's about you. Come on, you're kind of a big deal. I mean, look at you. <laughs> it's all about you. It's about what you want. That's not, come on. The Bible's telling you to do something you don't feel like doing. You don't have to do it. Don't do it. I mean, is it really going to help? Is it really going to lead? No, no, it seems hard. I Just say no. Like, Come on, your, your, your salvation's already set, set. You, you believe in Jesus, you profess with your mouth, you were baptized when you were younger, you can kind of do what you want. Just figure it out. You don't need all that truth stuff. You don't need to build your life on any of that. No, 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 no. Those are the kinds of lies. The devil's schemes are trying to get us away from truth is to not trust the process. Have you ever excused yourself from a diet or a workout regimen? By doubting the results, ah, but like, would it really do that for me, right? It's like the easiest way to get off the hook. You see somebody else, you have a friend, they start something, they get fit, they get healthy. Ah, would that really help me? All right, we excuse it away. In the same way, if all you have to do is cast doubt on the results, and you'll find yourself no longer living out the truth that God has for you. His truth is not just something to believe, it's something to live. Pastor Sam, you preach about that a lot. You preach about how we live a lot. Yes, I'm always going to go back. Okay, great. We believe it. Now we got to live it. It's got to change us. It's got to transform us by the renewal of our mind. We got to become different. We got to walk out the ways of Jesus. We got to practice this. I talked about this a bit when we had our artisan message a few weeks ago. But I think it's helpful again when looking at how much we trust the truth. You see, many trust that God created everything. I trust that he created everything. I believe the truth that he created everything, but still struggle to trust his intentional design. Yes, I believe you made it, but I want to determine its use. You believe my body, you made my body, but I want to determine what I do with it. I want to determine how I treat it. I want to determine what's right for me. So I believe you are the creator, but I want to be the designer. I want to be the one that crafts it. And God's saying, hey, you got to trust me with the whole thing. You got to trust me with the whole thing. You got to believe that I've got good plans for you. You got to believe that I've got the best in mind for you. You got to believe that my way is the best way. It's not the easiest way. It's a straight and narrow not many are going to find it, but you got to believe. you got to trust the results. 
And the results are not, we know, if we believe the whole gospel narrative, the, the results may not be seen on this side of eternity. And if you ask yourself the question, are you okay with that? Are you okay with blessings that come later? Not as some carrot that God is dangling, but as the reality of his word. You know what? I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay if I get it on the other side of eternity. I'm okay if I don't get recognition from man for this. Because I know it's doing, part of the blessing I get to have is being a healthy soul. Being a healthy human. But we start to ask questions about his truth. Will this really bring fulfillment? Is it really going to do it? Is it compromising easier? Can't I just kind of have both? Won't it feel better? How could it really be true when I so often don't feel like following it? These types of questions come up in our minds and they begin to circulate around our brain. But I think it would be helpful for us to go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4-6. through 6. We read it last week, but it's applicable again. But you, church, you belong to God. My dear children, you have already won a victory over those people. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. You have the truth. You can overcome the darkness. Jesus is stronger. Jesus is the way. He has the victory. And those people, they belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint. We have to stop being shocked when people sound like the world. We have to stop being shocked when people live like the world. They're speaking and living and acting according to the world's viewpoints. What are they doing? They're searching for truth. They're searching for a message that they can, they're searching for some type of foundation that they can build their life on. And if it's not Jesus, it won't work. And so the world listens to them because they're speaking from the world's viewpoint. But we, church, artisan, we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. How do how does everybody in America not hear? I got to tell them. I, I, why, why doesn't everybody get it? I don't understand. Because they don't know God. They don't know God. Why? Why doesn't everybody understand? Because they don't know Jesus. So they don't listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. They have the spirit of truth. How do we know if someone's actually got the truth in them? Are they living this thing out? Are they speaking the word of God? Are they aligning their lives with it? Are they working hard to have the truth of God hold their whole lives together? This entire text is wild to me. It's so clear. You do not have the truth in you if you speak from the viewpoint of the world. We have to sound different in speech. Do we sound different? Do we even sound appealing? You see, one issue with truth is when Christians honestly want non-followers to follow the truth, follow this, live like this. This is your moral standard, but they have, are yet to put their faith in Jesus. This has done a lot of damage to the works of Jesus. Is when Christians demand moral alignment before the person has actually encountered the person of Jesus. An easy example from history, the low-hanging fruit example would be prohibition, Right? A lot of Christians got together and said, alcohol is the devil's juice. Let's get it banned. Let's make it illegal. That will solve the sin. <laughs> so funny, isn't it? That'll solve the sin issue. No one's going to drink if we just make it illegal because it's a political issue. No, it's not. What happened? It gave birth to organized crime in America. It made people better at sinning around alcohol. <laughs> it made people better at causing more issues, caused more problems. It didn't solve anything. Why? Because the idea of prohibition, if, if the gospel message is all about prohibiting people from sinning, it's carrot and stick. It's wrong. It's out of alignment. Because when we try to get somebody, would you just follow the ways of Jesus? And they're like, I don't even believe in Jesus. That's the problem. They need a soul transformation before the behavior modification. And so we have to be careful that as we are carriers of the truth, that we are not shocked when the world talks like the world, says things like the world, lives like the world, sins like... Why would we be shocked? Because it's the devil's schemes lived out in people. What we should be doing is saying, man, I, 
Rather than tell you how terrible you are, maybe I could just tell you how great Jesus is. Maybe I could just show you how amazing my Savior is. That if you could get a revelation of who Jesus is, do you believe that the revelation of who Jesus was is what changed your life? Because it's what changed my life. It was never anybody saying, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing, stop doing. If you would just stop, I'll give you. Nope, none of that motivation worked with me. A revelation of Jesus' love for me. I still remember a like clear moment. I shared this a couple years ago. But I, I literally remember feeling dirtier than I've ever felt. Like just feeling just covered in sin, feeling gross. And I was in worship. And maybe you're there. Have you ever been in worship and you feel completely unworthy? You're like, I do not deserve to be able to worship in spirit and in truth. I felt this. I was just like, man, I'm so dirty. And I was closing my eyes and just shame and condemnation and the lies of the enemy. You're worthless. You're trash. You're garbage. Just go live your life. You, this church thing, you already blew it. You already wrecked it. And I remember just in my heart going, Jesus... Like, if you're real, I just need you to show yourself to me. Like, I just need something from you. And I literally had this vision in my mind. And it was Jesus coming out of the clouds, and his arms were wide open. And I literally felt his embrace. I felt him hug me and say, I love you. I'm proud of you. I love you. And I felt the grace of Jesus in my life. That's the moment that changed my life. It was nobody telling me how dirty and, and, and how, how, how all the trash I had, how gross I was, how broken I was. It was Jesus saying, I love you. It's the revelation of Jesus. It's when our footing is founded and grounded and our roots have grown deep into the revelation of who Jesus is that we can stand firm in the faith and then handle the attacks of the enemy. And we can lock in with the belt of truth, to hold the whole thing together. We can live our lives according to that truth. And our footing can be solid and our trust can be in the truth and our heart can be protected by the breastplate of righteousness. Those are just the first three. <laughs> How many guys are excited for next week? Come on, somebody. This is hope-filled. This is like, man, it's not your strength, it's God's strength. You need to be strengthened in the Lord to carry the full armor. And uh, I want everybody to stand to their feet. Maybe I just described a moment where Jesus came and met me. And I really feel to, as the prayer teams make their way forward, I really feel just to have a moment for people to do exactly that. To do what Romans 10.10, 10, what we read, reminds us. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right, righteous with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. I believe that this morning, I want to give an opportunity. We didn't even do this in first service. I just feel led in this service that some people might need the opportunity to openly declare their faith and be saved. And then believe in their heart so that they might be made righteous. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just wonder... Is there somebody here that as I was talking about this person of Jesus, you're just clear. You just know. Maybe you've even believed he's real, but you're realizing you've never put your faith and your trust in him. And you've never openly declared and become righteous according to his works, not your works. It's a new view of faith. It's a new view of this. And if you're here and you know you just need to put your trust in Jesus, you need to commit to him with nobody looking around. Would you just raise up a hand so I know who's praying with me? I just want to see those hands. Yep. Anybody else? Yep. Three, three hands, amazing, four hands, so good, five hands, yeah, yeah. One more moment, anybody else? I'm still looking, just want to acknowledge you. Awesome. Then let's pray, and as a church, let's say this together. Would you pray this with me? Out loud, together, just repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I love you. Be with me. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. Come into my life. Make me whole. And make me new. And make me righteous. I love you, Jesus. I repent of my sin. And I give it to you. In your name we pray. 
And everybody said, amen. Can you make some noise for those five people who raised their hand, publicly declaring, openly declaring their faith?